Well, hello, church. If you would open to John 15. John 15, we'll get back at this this chapter. Uh, We started it last week, and we will... Let's actually read through uh, verse 16, 1 to 16 right now. This is God's Word. It says this, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you, keep my fa- if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Father, um, every time I read those words, I just think of uh, how much deeper and richer they are than I thought the time before that when I read them. And and there's so much here, Lord. Uh, There's so much more than we can talk about. There's so much more than we can understand. Lord, I pray that you would give us some measure of illumination tonight. Uh, that this would benefit us more than just merely understanding intellectually, but Lord, that there would be transformation of character that would happen. Salvation could happen through your word. Sanctification of your church. We need you to come, Holy Spirit, and work your good graces in and through this church uh, in this moment. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me remind us, uh, give us some context to get us back into this. Uh, I said last week, uh, we're on sacred ground here. Uh, chapter 13, if you remember, uh, we began this the, the Friday, um, or, or Thursday rather, the day before Jesus' death. And so uh, Judas has left at this point. Jesus is alone with the, with the 11 in the upper room. And they are about to, to chapter 14 at the end. Jesus says, come, let us go from here. And they leave that room uh, to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And so there's two views uh, as to what happens next as they leave the upper room and head to the Garden of Gethsemane. Some believe that they pass by what's called Herod's Temple. Um, and... They see, as they would go by Herod's temple, they would have seen large uh, golden Josephus. The the Jewish historian tells us there would have been golden uh, vine and branches 
on the door of Herod's temple. And they would have seen that, and this would have been the background for this teaching that Jesus is giving in John 15. Um, that's possible. Um, I, I think more likely uh, they, they left the upper room and they went uh, before the Kidron Valley, uh, which is east of Jerusalem, by a wine vineyard. And G. Campbell Morgan speculated and said this. He says, as they, that is the disciples, hear Jesus speaking about the vine and branches, they would have seen behind him uh, a valley where not only there was a vine and vineyards and branches, but flames and small fires where they would have thrown the branches that were not bearing fruit to be burned. And this would have been the backdrop uh, for Jesus' teaching in John 15. We don't know which of those two it was, but uh, what we do know is that when Jesus begins to talk here, he, he, is, he is giving a metaphor. And D.A. Carson calls it an, an extended metaphor. And he says this, The divine imagery of a vine provides us with an extended metaphor without plot or illustrative comparison. And so what he's saying is in these 16 verses I just read, Jesus gives a, an extended metaphor that is more rich and profound than if he had, uh, had given us a long narrative, a long story, or if he would have given some complex illustration. There's more in this one metaphor, this one parable. And, and we have essentially three elements. It's absolutely amazing what he's able to, to fit into this, this very short amount of space here. He, he talks of a vine, which we looked at last week, was Christ. He talks about a vine dresser. We'll get to that next week. That is the father who is the vine dresser, the gardener. And then branches, which are disciples. And you could literally, you could write 10,000 books unpacking what he fit in one metaphor. And, um, and so we need to pause for a second and make sure we don't go wrong here. I think uh, J.C. Ryle gave a good warning uh, as we seek to interpret parables or metaphors. He said this, We must not forget the great rule that applies to all Christ's metaphors or parables. The great general lesson of each parable is the main thing to be noticed. The, the main point is the main thing to, to look for, he's saying. He says the minor def uh, details must not be tortured or pressed to an excess. Many false doctrines and misunderstandings have occurred when Christians press the details of a parable beyond what Jesus meant for them. And that is very true. It's very, very true. Uh, many, many... Uh, false teachings had been advocated and, and, and pushed forward because someone takes a parable of Jesus and pushes it further than it needed to go, further than Jesus meant it, it to go. And so J.C. Ryle uh, tries to help us get off in the right foot here, and he says, this metaphor teaches, above all else, the union between Christ and believers. That's the main point. I don't, want to, I don't want to move past that today, really. Uh, well, slightly. The, the Puritan said this, this whole parable, this metaphor, is about Christ's union with believers and communion with believers. Union and communion. I, I think that, that's a good summation of what we're seeing here. So those are my two points, the union, union with Christ, and then we'll look at communion with Christ. And um, I want to overview... Uh, these 16 verses, then we'll come back in, in, in the next week or so and, and look at some other things. Here, here's what's often overlooked about the doctrine of union with Christ uh, for many Christians. This is probably the most profound and central doctrine related to salvation in the whole Bible. Union with Christ. Uh, John Murray said, Union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation, yet strangely the most neglected. A.W. Pink said, Union with Christ is the most profound and the most blessed of any doctrine set forth in Scripture, yet sad to say there is hardly any more neglected. And he says the reason is probably that it's probably so ignored is because it is so profound. And so I, I think it's helpful to, to stop and say, why 
is this idea of union with Christ so profound and and, and to think of other ways that the Bible talks about union or unity or oneness with, with God um, or oneness with another. I, I, I think we could first start with marriage. The Bible, you know, Genesis chapter 2, we're already seeing this idea of oneness or unity uh, in, in relation to marriage. Uh, we see, uh, well, I guess it, maybe we should remember the way, this is not the way the world views marriage, a type of oneness that the scripture put forth. Um, our culture at this point, marriage is just two individuals who decide to love each other and live together as long as it goes well. And if it doesn't go well at any point, you can separate and divorce. And, we, and in the state of Florida, we call that a no-fault divorce. And according to the billboards, it, te- it costs $137. There is no oneness. There is no unity. There's no idea of covenant like the Bible teaches covenant. It says, to become one flesh. The man, so marriage between a man, the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, so gender does matter in marriage. Uh, and then the, the two shall become, it says, one flesh, covenant union. The, the two become one flesh. So they're not, nece- they're not really individuals at that point so much as they are uh, one new family That's why Paul says in Ephesians 5, he who loves his wife loves himself. They're united. That's why Paul says again in 1 Corinthians 7, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and the husband likewise doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. How do you even say that? Unless two individuals have been united in such a profound covenant sense that they don't actually have authority over themselves in the way they did before they were married. And then think about the church. Jesus is called what? The head of the church, and we are called the body. So that we are not just a bunch of individuals merely. We are individual members of the body of Christ. It's a profound union. It's it's mysterious in many ways. Think of even the ordinances, uh, baptism. We are baptized into Christ into Christ. Uh, When we come to the table, when we take the Lord's Supper, we think of what Jesus said when he first uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. He said, this is my body, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me, eat, drink. And then we know in in, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, Jesus said uh, this very strange teaching, eat my body and drink my blood which sounded as crazy to the people who heard it originally as it does to us. And he wasn't saying that when you eat the bread and drink the cup, you are literally bringing the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus into yourself so that there's some sort of saving grace. He's not saying what the Catholics say on this. He is saying, uh, and he's not merely saying that it's symbolic, it's just purely symbolism. He is saying that when you receive the drink, when you receive the, the, the bread, you are to, by faith, take his death into yourself. By faith, in such a way, it becomes part of you. And therefore, it begins to transform you. There is a real spiritual element to even the table in how we commune with Christ in our union with Christ. When you go to the table in a minute, think, by faith, by faith, by faith, I am one with Christ. There's a mystery there. Or think about Jesus himself. What is Jesus Christ? Is he God? Is he man? How could he be God and man in one body? Is that possible? Well, we call that hypostatic union. Union, hypostatic union is the term for that. Jesus is God and man, fully, 100% God, 100% man, not 50 and 50, 100% both in the body and the person of Jesus Christ. That is a union. And then think of even the Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. Three gods? No. One God in three persons. 
You say, where do you get that? Well, we could read a ton of scriptures, but John 10, Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. We're one. When you've seen the Father, you've seen me. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's a mysterious union in the Godhead. So you say, Pastor, with all respect, I'm a little more confused now <laughs> than when you started uh, by what you mean by union with Christ. I mean, this seems like a little bit more mysterious than it did a minute ago. Are you saying that it's like two individuals becoming one in marriage? Are you saying uh, it, it's like Christ being the head and we're the body? Or is it like the, the hypostatic union with, with Christ uh, being God and man or the Trinity what is, what does it mean that we would be one with Christ, that we would be united to Christ? And um, I, I remembered this week a funny, uh, it was a panel discussion a number of years ago I saw uh, at a conference where John Piper was sitting there and they were talking about this doctrine of union with Christ. And they were doing a question and answer and somebody raises their hand and said, I'm a missionary in a foreign country and it's ministering to largely uneducated people, and there's all these cultural issues. How do I teach something so profound like union with Christ in this context? Uh, there's the question, and then John Piper says, okay, here's what you do. I want you to picture a vine, and then I want you to picture branches, <laughs> and then the branches are coming out of the vine. That's union with Christ. And he's right. <laughs> Jesus is doing something incredibly profound here. He's taking one of the most difficult to understand doctrines that there is, and he is literally giving it in the most simplistic way possible. It, it's, it's, this is what he, Jesus knows he's not speaking to a bunch of seminary grads. He's not, this isn't a group of PhD students that he's, he's lecturing to in John 15. He is speaking to some, some young fishermen, a tax collector. He's talking to some college-age guys that didn't go to college. This is the, he's going, guys, I, I, I need to make this as simple as possible. Here's what union with me means. This is what it's like. You see the branches here in the vineyard? You, you see there, there's a vine and then there's branches coming out of it. Do you see that? Are we all on the same page? And then what, how are those branches connected to the vine? They're, and then here's the word. In the vine. And that word in is not a throwaway word. The word in is not like the word um. You know, it goes in between two important words. It's a filler word. That's not the word in. I-N. That's not what that is in Scripture. It is the important word. Look, look at verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. And here... Uh, Listen, I'm going to read a few passages. This is amazing how we, we just so quickly read over this word, and it's, it's tragic because it's so central. Uh, let me read a few passages. You don't have to turn to these. I'll read them quickly. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ... From the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us through adoption. And then it goes on. It says, in him we have a redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he set forth in Christ for the plan of his, for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. We could go on, but in these two passages, election is in Christ, regeneration is in Christ, faith and repentance are in Christ, wisdom and righteousness are in Christ, justification, sanctification, glorification, in Christ. Which is why, uh, which is why John Murray said union with Christ is, is not simply a step 
in the process of redemption. It underlines every step of the order of salvation. So, so think of salvation like a wheel. And you have all these doctrines coming out to hold the wheel in place. Union with Christ is not a spoke in the wheel. It's the hub center. It's what holds all the doctrines of Christ together. Guys, do, do we understand every blessing we have in, is in Christ? All of them. All of them. Listen, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, uh, lives, but Christ who lives in me. Philippians 3, 8 and 9, I count all things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Colossians 3, 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it goes on in Philippians 3, we're found in Christ. Romans 8, we're preserved in Christ. uh, 2 Timothy 1, we are saved and sanctified in Christ. uh, Colossians 2, we walk in Christ, we labor in Christ, we live in Christ, we obey in Christ, we die in Christ, we conquer in Christ. Every blessing that is ours is ours in Him. And all those passages I just read were written by the Apostle Paul. And it's worth noting that, you know, the, the Apostle Paul in his writings, he, all of his letters, 13 letters, about 100 pages. About 100 pages. In those 100 pages, he, he says the phrase, in Christ, 200 times. Now, I don't know about you, 100 pa- if I'm reading a book, a little 100-page book, and I see the same phrase 200 times, I'm thinking, this is... This is important. And in James, uh, a man named James Stewart, he's a Scottish pastor and theologian, he said, union with Christ is the heart of Paul's theology. Which I think he's just getting from Jesus. Who said this in in John 15, look back there, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine... Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in me, in you. And then look at verse 10. Abide in my love. In my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as the Father has kept, uh, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. What, what do we need to see here? We need to see that Jesus desires us to be in him, united to him, in union with him. He desires that. He's not just saying, follow me, walk next to me, try to be like me. Those have their place. He's saying, I need to be in you and you need to be in me. This is how this relationship needs to work. Union. And the word, think of what the word abide means. I know many of our translations, we're reading the ESV, it says abide, but if you have a New American Standard or an NIV, what word is there? Remain. Remain in me, which implies something, doesn't it? It implies you're already united to him. You're already in union with him. So therefore, the command is remain there. You're you're there. You're already in him by faith. Now remain in me. And here's how the old theologians, I, I, I feel this is helpful. I'm going to give this to us for a second. The old theologians would talk about it. They would make this distinction. They would say union with Christ is monergistic, meaning God does it without our help. 
He doesn't need your help to bring you into Christ. He does that on his own. So Ephesians 2 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. He makes you alive and brings you in out of your deadness. He gives you spiritual life. And here, here's the question. Who initiated you being in union with Christ? You or God? Who initiated that? Who is the, let me phrase this right, who is the first decisive mover? Who chose who? You say, how is, that really, uh, how is that really what Jesus is getting at? Well, he does mention it. Look at verse 16. This is apparently important for us to see. Verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. In, in this discussion on union with Christ, you didn't choose me and enter in. The branches don't decide to be part of the vine. The vine decides to make a branch. You didn't, you, this isn't because of your moral performance. This isn't because you decided from spiritual death to have spiritual life and, and become a branch out of the vine. We, we don't have that ability. The vine decides. He says, I chose you. You did not choose me. And Jesus is not, he's not trying to pick a debate on free will and, and election here. He's just saying, this is how union with me works. This is how it works. God initiates. He's the decisive actor. God connects branches to the vine. So union with Christ is monergistic. But, now listen, that doesn't mean there isn't a personal responsibility on our part to abide or to remain. That's where communion with Christ comes in. So we have union with Christ, monergistic, Communion with Christ is what we would call synergistic, meaning we play a part. We have a role. That's why you showing up here today and sitting under the word or singing or, or time you have alone with the Lord in prayer or the word, these things actually matter, whether you're communing with Christ or not. That's synergistic. You must put forth some effort in, in the common means of grace. Listen, here's how Paul says it. Romans 15, 18. He says, I, I will only speak of what Christ has accomplished through me. Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. So Christ accomplished things through me. Or 1 Corinthians 15, 10. God's grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, any of the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God that is within me. He says, I worked harder. I got out of bed earlier. I read more. I memorized more. I, I studied more. I went and visited more people. I opened my mouth and preached the gospel. I was persecuted more. I did more than any of them. Yet, not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Synergistic. I, I, I'm, next week, I'm going to come at this passage, and I'm going to just say this to us. You must bear much fruit. You must. You must bear much fruit. Um, but what i got to say right now is you can't. Not by yourself. Not apart from abiding in the, in the vine. Look at Jesus says this in, in John 15, 5. Look at John 15, 5. I hope everybody has a Bible. Put your eyes. I want you all to see this is not my teaching. John 15, 5, toward the end. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So that only branches that are connected to the vine uh, can, can bear fruit. Apart from the vine, you can do nothing. 
This is why uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the first to come up with this, but I wrote down uh, this week, divine produce. Divine produce, meaning you don't make fruit happen. You don't, make, you don't bring forth fruit. The vine brings forth fruit through the branches. I hope you'll think through that. That could be extremely helpful. It, it would not be right. It would be too much to say that he needs us. God doesn't need anyone. It would, be, it would be more accurate to say that God, in his providence, has so built the vineyard to work that the vine produces fruit through the branches, not apart from them. The vine produces fruit through the branches, not apart from them. G. Campbell, G. Campbell Morgan said it like this. He expresses, that is God, that he expresses himself through us in fruit. He expresses himself in the world through us, his disciples, bearing fruit. That is really profound. And, and think about it in, in relation to prayer. I'll give you a quote. A guy named uh, R.V.G. Tasker. He, uh, he taught New Testament at University of London years ago. He said this. He said, believers' prayers are in fact the prayers that Christ is praying. The believers' prayers are the prayers that Christ is praying. And not only prayers, but he, he mentions obedience. Our obedience is really his obedience through us. The vine producing the fruit through the branches. Listen to Hudson Taylor, uh, old missionary to, to China. He was studying this passage and, and he said this. He said, as I thought about the vine and the branches, what light the blessed spirit poured direct into my soul. I saw not only uh, that Jesus would never leave me and that I was a member of his body, his flesh, his bones, and that the, the, that the vine is not the root merely, but the whole root the stem, the branches, the twigs, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. Jesus is not only that. He's the soil, the sunshine, the air, the rain. And 10,000 times more than we've ever dreamed, wished for, or needed. And you go, why would, why would he, he make the vineyard work like that? And Jesus tells us in verse 8, By this, my Father is glorified. Why would God make the vineyard work so that everything is essentially being done either through us, but by Him, so that He gets all glory and the branches don't boast? God doesn't want branches going, look what I did. I did more than them. Why didn't he? He doesn't want boasting branches, and he wants all glory. And so he ordered it to work this way so that he could say, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's all for the glory of my Father. Now, again, this does not mean that because we can't take credit for the fruit that comes from our lives, that we have no responsibility to bear fruit. We have responsibility to bear fruit. Some, I, I know people are going to ask me after the sermon, or uh, we'll get this in city group, if, we, if I don't say what the fruit is for a second, even though this is not the point of the sermon today, but we will talk about obedience. We will talk about prayer. Uh, we will talk about uh, evangelism and love and joy. These things are fruits, but that's... I think the thing we need to, to, to just pause and, and know first is that we don't actually produce that fruit in and of ourselves, but only as we abide in the vine. And look at how Jesus says this again. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
So if you abide in the vine, the fruit is automatic. Automatic. That's what he's saying. This is why a wise mentor of mine, uh, when I was younger, he would try to hammer this through my thick skull. I'd be like, I can't stay disciplined in this. I can't overcome this. I can't, I'm struggling with this. And, and I would just kind of vomit up all the dysfunction in my life and all the things that weren't as I wanted them to be. And, and he would just stop me and say, John Mark, think about the core. Are you abiding in Christ? Is your relationship with the Lord okay? Because when you start talking about all these things going wrong and all the lack of fruit here, all the unhealth coming out of your branches, something's wrong with the core. Are you abiding in Christ? And I would get frustrated because I'd be like, I'm at church, I'm, I read my Bible, I'm praying, you know, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, then why is the fruit so bad? Are you really abiding in Christ, John Mark? And he would press me. And he was right. We're going to study this more next week, but I don't want to leave us hanging too much. Jesus is doing something incredibly profound here. I want to point it out. We can think on it during the week and then come back next week. But this is literally what he's doing. He's saying to abide in him is to abide in his word. And to abide in his word is to abide in his love. And to abide in his love is to abide in his commandments. And to abide in his commandments is to abide in love for one another. That is, your believers in the local church. That's what it means to abide in Christ. He literally puts it all together. He, he collapses them into each other so that it, it is all uh, bound up in abiding in Christ. It's very, very profound what Jesus is doing here. And guys, this is, uh, this is really good news because here's what it means. I'll let Andrew Murray say it to us because he's very encouraging. He says, abiding is for the weak. That's why it's encouraging. Because some of y'all are like, well, so much for that abiding thing. That seems too hard. I'm too busy. I have to listen to this. Abiding is for the weak. It really is. Listen to how he said. He says it is not doing some great thing. It does not demand that we first live up to a very holy, devoted life. No, it is simply weakness entrusting itself to the mighty one to be kept. It is the unfaithful casting oneself on the one who is altogether trustworthy and true. Abiding in him is not a work we have to do as a condition for enjoying his salvation, but a consenting to let him do all for us, in us, through us. Our part is simply to yield, to trust, to wait for what he is engaged to perform. So many Christians... We just don't get this. We, we don't understand. We just see abide as, as another work that if I do really good at abiding that week, I feel very self-confident and happy that I did good. And if I don't abide well, now it's self-pity and frustration and discouragement. And Murray's just pleading with us. He's saying, he says, wandering one, the Jesus who drew you, when he said, come, So it is the same Jesus who keeps you when he says abide. The grace to come and the grace to abide are alike from him alone. That's why I titled the sermon, The Grace of Union and Communion with Christ. It is all grace. It is all grace. I'm going to close By just asking you, this is, what what do you hear when you hear that call to abide in him? When 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 you read Jesus say, abide in me, what do you hear? Because what you hear says a lot about you. It really does. And I just want to plead with you to hear this as a call to die. 
I want to plead with you to hear it as a call to live. I want to plead with you to hear it as a word of hope when you're despairing. Hear it as grace and a place to cleanse you from every sin. Hear it as a promise to keep you to the end. Hear it as a call to trust him. Because, listen, that's how you abide. That's how, you say, how, how do I abide practically? How do I do that? Trust him. That's how you abide. And, and think about how trust works. How, how do you trust someone? Do you do something in your own heart? Do you muster that up? Oh, I've got to trust this person. I've got to, how, how does trust actually work? Trust is not something that I work up in myself when I look at someone and think how I need to trust that person. They do all the work. That other person does all the work, and then I see their trustworthiness, and I trust them. That's how trust works. It, it, all the burden of work is on the other person. I'm just looking at and acknowledging that's a trustworthy person. They've done this thing or this many things that make them trustworthy to me. Therefore, I will trust them. All of the burden of work is on the other person. And that's how it works with God. Your trust in God is really just automatic if he has proven himself trustworthy. Hence the need to continually be in the word. Reminding ourselves he is trustworthy. He is good. Brothers and sisters, this is not the law of Moses. This is our refuge. This is the hiding place for us in all of our trials. That, what is that song, that old song we sing? Uh, it starts with this, this, uh, this line and it ends with this line. A rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. In thee. Brothers and sisters, that's where you belong. Now and forever. In Christ. In Christ. Abide. Abide in him. Let's pray for the grace to do it. Father, oh Lord, I just don't get a lot of joy out of studying these things uh, as much or saying them as much as just being able to do this tonight when we all get home, tomorrow when we go to work, throughout this week, Lord, help us to abide. Help us to understand so that we can do it, Lord. We want to be doers of your word. Lord, help us to abide in you in your commands, in your love, in love for one another. You've been so good to us, Lord. You've earned our trust, and now help us to trust you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.